You're watching Behind the Headlines, I'm Lee Pacquiao. In his most recent State of the Union address, President Obama briefly announced plans to seek a major free trade agreement with the European Union. Supporters say such an agreement would spur business in the United States by removing various trade barriers. But, as with many things, there are plenty of obstacles to pushing this deal through. Joining me now to discuss the plan is Jim Bacchus. Jim currently chairs the Global Practice Group at Greenberg Traurig. In a previous life, of course, he served as the chair of the appellate body at the WTO, and he was a two-time congressman from the great state of Florida. We're very ha happy to have him join us from Washington, D.C. Jim, welcome. Good to see you, my friend. Uh, thank you, Lee. It's good to be back. Jim, this seems like a big deal, but then again, we already ha trade a lot with the EU. Why exactly do we need a free trade agreement with Europe? Well, let me say, first of all, that uh, if I were still in the Congress, I would be supporting this initiative and I would uh, undoubtedly vote for it. Uh, the reason is that it could be a big deal for both the United States and Europe. Uh, every day, every day, $2.7 billion worth of uh, a trade goes back and forth between the United States and Europe. Uh, our tariffs uh, are uh, relatively low between uh, the two continents, uh, about three or four percent, depending on how you count it. Economists say that if we did nothing in this agreement but eliminate tariffs, then that would produce $180 billion in growth uh, in both uh, uh, of uh, the United States and Europe uh, over the next five years. So that alone is worth it, and most of this deal could be in non-tariff barriers to trade that are the true obstacles to trade uh, between uh, the two sides. Right, it's interesting. I think the strongest criticism I saw came from, I think it was the South African ambassador to the WTO. Uh, he suggested that this deal would be harmful to the WTO trading system. Now, Jim, you worked at the WTO at a high level for years. Is he right? And if so, how would this agreement harm the WTO? Well, uh, Ambassador Ismail could be right if we do this wrong. Uh, what I would suggest is that we uh, find a way to do this right. The right way to uh, do this particular deal between the United States and Europe would be to do it as a WTO agreement, what is called a plurilateral agreement mm -hmm. among some WTO members that's permissible under the WTO treaty. It could be WTO plus, uh, and it could be open over time to all other WTO members, the 100 or so worldwide who would not be participating in this particular negotiation. Mm. That would multiply the potential payoff in terms of economic growth in the United States, in Europe, and elsewhere. But for some reason, uh, the United States and Europe don't seem to be taking that course. This right. puzzles me. Jim, I, I, yeah, it, it surprises me as well. Why didn't the Obama administration, in your opinion, simply start with the idea of expanding the WTO platform? It sounds easier. Especially puzzling is the fact that they have, I think quite correctly, come to the conclusion recently that they need to abandon the Doha round uh, uh, single undertaking in which uh, you don't conclude anything until all the countries in the world that are participating in the negotiations agree on everything. There's a lot in the Doha round that really needs to be concluded, but that approach hasn't been working. The United States has led the effort, along with Europe and the WTO, to try to take uh, uh, an approach that would involve a coalition of the willing, if you will, among WTO members, to conclude an international services agreement that would be WTO+. Plus. Mm -hmm. They could take the same approach with this transatlantic deal that they're talking about. There are already very good and effective WTO agreements on uh, technical regulations, on standards, on the uh, food and health uh, safety uh, regulations that are called uh, sanitary and phytosanitary measures. All these have been very effective. Uh, the United States and Europe could agree that amongst themselves uh, they would improve upon uh, those rules, make them WTO plus, conclude such an agreement within the WTO treaty in a way that would enable other countries to uh, join later on, including South Africa, India, Brazil, uh, China, others when and if they wished. And furthermore, this would then be enforceable under what has been a very effective WTO dispute settlement system. As it is, if they conclude this as uh, uh, some separate uh, so-called free trade agreement, uh, they would have to invent a new dispute settlement system. Mm. Furthermore, 
there is a real question as to whether this would meet the definition in the WTO treaty of uh, a free trade agreement. If it does not, it could then undermine uh, the multilateral trading system, as the South African ambassador has suggested, by undermining the most favored nation uh, principle of non-discrimination that is the very heart of the world trading system. Mm. Jim, should this agreement come to pass, I got to wonder what it will all mean for the business of law and for people working at large law firms. Um, if this goes through, are we going to see more mergers? Is new work going to be generated? Um, is cross-border work going to be facilitated in some way? What's, gonna, what's, what's this all going to mean for lawyers? In terms of trade work and investment work, uh, the more negotiations there are, the better uh, for trade and investment lawyers. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of uh, international cross-border work, the more we globalize, the more uh, law firms become global. Uh, the provision of legal services is uh, what we call in the WTO world trade and services. And uh, it, it can be provided uh, worldwide to the extent that barriers are lowered to the provision of those services worldwide. There are restrictions uh, domestically everywhere in the world on uh, the ability of lawyers from other countries to produce uh, and perform uh, domestically in that country. Uh, when the uh, WTO finally gets to the question of addressing uh, uh, legal services uh, as opposed to other kinds of services, then my colleagues in the bar will truly begin to understand uh, the overall significance of the WTO. Right on. Jim, I should note that not everyone is a fan of free trade agreements. Uh, NAFTA, for all its benefits, is still not viewed, at least universally, as a positive thing. It brought the good and the bad associated with globalization. Um, the downsides in NAFTA were particularly felt in American manufacturing. But where are the downsides in this potential deal? Would it impact, say, professional service providers like, law like lawyers more negatively? Can you talk about some of the potentially less desirable effects of this uh, potential agreement? Well, first of all, as uh, someone who strongly supported the NAFTA when I was in the Congress, let me say that uh, it, it's wrong to blame uh, NAFTA if it rains on Tuesday, which is uh, what tends to be uh, the uh, political uh, uh, inclination in the United States, Canada, Mexico alike. Uh, the truth of the matter is that NAFTA has been uh, a quite a big success. Uh, for all three of the NAFTA parties, and in my view, uh, we should be focusing especially on trying to uh, deepen and broaden uh, the uh, trade and investment arrangements uh, among the NAFTA countries as a way of making all three of our countries much more competitive in the world marketplace. Uh, my friend Bob Zellick, the, pre the former president of the World Bank, just made this uh, same point in, in a speech last week. That said, I don't think uh, that in political terms we'll see the same kinds of uh, controversies emerge in a negotiation uh, between the United States and Europe as we did between the United States and Mexico uh, especially because um, the United States and Europe, uh, while we have our differences in, in the ways in which we approach things, are by and large at the same stage of development, and we do take uh, very similar approaches to our regulatory regimes. So I don't think you're going to see the political opposition uh, to uh, a U.S.-EU deal that you would see uh, in uh, the prospect of a free trade deal uh, with uh, some developing country. Mm. So, Jim, you've been watching this space for a long time. Uh, help us unpack the next steps here. What's, uh, what's going to happen going forward as this uh, deal progresses through the uh, normal course of things? The United States and Europe both say they want to conclude uh, a deal within 18 months. We'll see. Is that and a short a time frame for this type of thing? Uh, yes, uh, uh, especially if they decide on uh, a broad agenda. And that's the first question. Uh, what will be on the agenda? Will it just be tariffs? Uh, will it uh, include uh, regulations uh, and standards as well? Will we get into uh, the naughty issue of uh, trade in agriculture, which has divided the United States and Europe for decades and is uh, probably the single biggest reason why there is an impasse uh, in the Doha round of global trade negotiations? The first step will be to decide on an agenda. This will only be worthwhile uh, as an undertaking if the agenda is broad, because there will be much more economic payoff from a broad deal on uh, either side of the Atlantic. And also, I go back to the question I raised, which is, uh, 
uh, will this be a free trade agreement that will fit the definition legally of a free trade agreement in the WTO treaty? Uh, in order to uh, uh, fit that defini definition, it must cover, in the words of uh, the treaty, substantially all the trade between the United States and Europe. No one really knows what that phrase means in uh, WTO law. I was able to serve as a judge uh, in Geneva at the WTO for nearly a decade without having to define that term. And I was able to get out of Geneva alive without having to get into that uh, particular legal morass. But this could raise that particular issue, especially since, as we've already seen from the South African uh, ambassador, uh, other uh, among our trading partners are raising their hand and raising this issue. Fundamentally, a free trade agreement between some countries is a decision to discriminate against other countries. Mm -hmm. If we lower barriers to trade between the United States and Europe and don't lower them elsewhere, this discriminates against our other trading partners. This is permissible under WTO rules only if uh, this particular agreement fits the definition of uh, a free trade agreement. And what concerns uh, so many uh, in the WTO who are not uh, in the United States or in Europe is that th this approach could further undermine uh, the fundamental principle of non-discrimination that is the great strength and the great lure of the world trading system that we uh, have created under the auspices of the WTO. Uh, Jim, I want to thank you for coming on. This is really complicated stuff, but it's also very important because it impacts so many people's lives on an individual level. Thanks for walking us through this today. My pleasure. That's Jim Bacchus from Greenberg Traurig. If you'd like to learn more about the cases and issues we just discussed, be sure to go check out our offerings on BloombergLaw.com and also on the Bloomberg Terminal. You can see more of our videos on YouTube, and you can follow our updates on Twitter. I'm Lee Pacquia. Thanks for watching.